Catherine with Free Tours by Foot. Today we're going to go on a little walk along the High Line, so let's go ahead and go up the stairs and get started. Okay, so we are starting at the Gansevoort Street entrance to the High Line. So this is the southern end of the High Line. We are actually right here. That is the entrance to the Whitney Museum of American Art right here at the base of the High Line. But we'll be able to see the Whitney a lot better once we get up these stairs. So this park has only been opened since 2009 and the entire thing wasn't even finished in 2009. That was just the first section. And despite what a short time it is, relatively speaking, to be a tourist attraction in New York City. It is one of the most visited spots by people from out of town, but very popular with locals as well. This is really the development of the High Line has changed this entire part of Manhattan. We'll talk a lot more about that while we walk. But now we are officially up on the High Line. So if you are not familiar with what the High Line is, this is a public park but as you can see over here, it is actually built right on top of what used to be elevated rail tracks. So these elevated tracks were put in in the 1930s. It was a big project called the West Side Improvement Project. Talk about the necessity for that, why they did that a little bit later on. But this was the site of a lot of train activity in the 1930s and 1940s, bringing in goods, especially uh, for food production here into New York City. So here is the top of the Whitney up here. It's designed by Renzo Piano. The Whitney has actually had a long history. It started down in Greenwich Village. It's had a couple other locations and homes as well. It was started by Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney. This current iteration of the Whitney was designed alongside the High Line. So it is here because the High Line is here because of the popularity of High Line Park. And down here, I know it's like a weird thing to be showing you, but I wanted to show you this because we are technically in a part of the city called the Meatpacking District. Meatpacking District today is known mostly for being really trendy and having lots of very expensive shops and cool spots to go out at night. It used to be called the Meatpacking District because it was literally the meatpacking district. There were over 200 meatpacking companies here. There are very, very few left, but there are still a couple. So the name meatpacking district still actually makes at least a little bit of sense. Um, so the rail link here was actually really important for a lot of the food production companies here. Um, these meatpacking plants were here. Things could be loaded onto trains and taken right out of New York City. Uh, there were some other food production companies in this area that were reliant on what the trains were bringing in from other parts of the country. So a lot of the freight lines, not passenger lines, but freight lines ran down the west side. Passenger lines tended to come down more of the center of the island. But here you can see some of the old rail tracks. And I think one of the really cool things about the High Line one of the things people really like about it is the High Line never tries to mask what it was. We're not trying to disguise the fact that this used to be railroad tracks. Um, in fact, the whole design of this place is to mimic what was already naturally happening here. So you had these very, very active train lines for some years, built this in the 1930s, train started running up and down. Things started to really change in the 1960s. What was going on at that time is refrigerated long distance trucking was being introduced and it was really, really reshaping the way we got food in this country, how food was delivered and how it was moved. Uh, rail, railroad cars weren't in as high of demand anymore. So the, the West Side Rail Line here started to fall out of use a little bit. The last train ran on the lines here in the 1980s. And so then this was abandoned. And it became kind of a popular thing for 
urban explorers to sneak up on the High Line, even though technically you weren't supposed to be doing it, hiking on the old rail tracks. And what they were noticing was that uh, there was a lot of growth that was happening naturally. Uh, grasses and, and flowers and shrubs growing here naturally on the High Line. And so when they went to build High Line Park, which like I said, officially opened in 2009 to the public, the landscape designer was really trying to mimic what had already happened here with the natural growth once the rail tracks became abandoned. So just a heads up, you are gonna probably see a lot of scaffolding. I know we're walking under some right now. It is a common sight in this area. Um, since the High Line did grow in popularity so much from the time that it was opened, there has been a lot of development in this area. Like I said, this whole part of Manhattan has really changed with the growth of the High Line, with the opening of new sections of the High Line. So you will see a lot of construction still. You can see pretty clearly, I think, as you walk, what was here before the High Line, before the rail tracks were elevated, uh, what was built alongside the High Line to kind of go with the High Line, and what's been built since. So one of the things built in conjunction with the High Line, this building right here. So that's the standard hotel, and that is built literally straddling the High Line. So this was a part of the plan from the beginning, really. The standard is also the site of a very, very popular rooftop bar. <laughs> um, not an inexpensive rooftop bar, but if you are looking for a great spot to get a really, really spectacular view, the, the standard is very, very popular. So over here, this says Friends of the High Line. Um, we have all of these names here. So Friends of the High Line is the name of the group that really got this project going. Um, you know, there were a lot of people that considered these abandoned tracks to be an eyesore. There was pressure on the city to demolish all of this, get rid of it. But there were people that recognized that what had already started up here, the plant life that was occurring up here, the fact that this was walkable, that there was something special here. And they started a campaign to develop this Actually, one of the really outspoken voices in favor of the High Line was the designer, Diane von Furstenberg. Um, she was part of the Friends of the High Line group uh, and actually also played a big hand in the development, the renewal of the meatpacking district itself. She moved right here. You can actually maybe see the sign that says Diane von Furstenberg. She moved here to the meatpacking district. A lot of other people followed. So we can get a look at the meatpacking district here. All right. A really beautiful day to walk the High Line today, but we're going to head over here to the edge and see what we can see from the railing over here. Now, one of the big changes recently is that because there's been so much development along the High Line, there are some things you can't see as well as you could. Um, you can actually see here, this is the Diller von Furstenberg sun deck, uh, some partially after Diane von Furstenberg. So if you can see that arched piece of metal over there, that actually used to be the entrance to the pier for the Cunard line, a uh, major transatlantic line. Uh, all of the transatlantic liners used to dock right along this stretch of the Hudson here. So. If you go back to the late 1800s, early 1900s, you would have had massive ocean liners coming here. Uh, the Cunard Line had many, many famous ships. Um, eventually, the Cunard Line joined with the White Star Line, which most people know because they ran the Titanic. Um, so eventually, you had the Cunard White Star Line. So those ships would have been docking over here. There's a big project going on they try to are starting to try to reuse a lot of this old pier area and trying to rebuild new things. So there's a new park space, this elevated park space over here, and there's going to be a beach area. It's actually a very, very cool project. Have some flowers growing up on the rail tracks right now. 
is it spring? And then over here, you do have a sun deck. You actually have these permanent built-in lounging spaces. And so when I say that this is utilized by locals as well as visitors, locals do like to come here and unwind. People that work in this area will come here on their lunch break, eat their lunch, sit in the sun, relax a little bit. So I know I mentioned that there was a lot of food production in this area. One of the biggest presents uh, as far as that industry would have been the National Bistic Biscuit Company. Uh, you probably heard of them. You've probably heard of them as Nabisco though. Nabisco owned a massive compound of buildings in this area and it was built here because of the railroad tracks. A lot of their buildings were actually specifically designed so that the rail cars could go directly inside and unload, wasting as little time as possible. So right over here, you can see these bridges going across. You can maybe see under the scaffolding the words NBC. NBC stood for National Biscuit Company. This building over here is also part of the National Biscuit Company. And this is now the home of Chelsea Market. Chelsea Market is an indoor food market. It's also the home of the Food Network. Some other things going on in there. The most important thing I think to know about the National Biscuit Company in this area is that this is where Oreos were invented. It's a very important day for all of us. I like Oreos. So, uh, so we're walking underneath part of Chelsea Market right here. If you are coming to walk the High Line at any point, I highly, highly, highly recommend um, starting with a walk through Chelsea Market first. And then you can go through, there, is, there are some amazing food options inside Chelsea Market. Bring a friend and then you can get a lot of things from different places. You can all try a little something. You can do that. And Chelsea Market's very close to the start of the High Line. And there's actually an entrance right next to Chelsea Market if you don't wanna go back to the Gansevoort Street entrance. So definitely something that is worth doing. So right up here, I wanted to show you, you can see this little piece of the High Line swinging off to the left here. Uh, these are referred to as spurs of the High Line. You can see the spur over there. These little spurs would go off of the main track and they would go directly into buildings. Like I said, this was a way of cutting down unloading time as much as possible. This big building here, was a refrigeration company. Uh, not something you probably hear of much anymore, but in the early days of the High Line, not every business or every restaurant had their own large commercial size refrigerator. So you would rent space in a building like this one for your refrigerated items. I love this area. This is one of my favorite parts of the High Line right here. And this is the 10th Avenue Overlook. So I'm gonna come give you a look at this. So they built this, it's 10th Avenue down there. Oh, and they just tripped, sorry about that. Uh, but you can sit here and just watch the traffic on 10th Avenue going underneath you. I know that sounds maybe a little bit weird. It is surprisingly relaxing as somebody who has sat there many a time um, watching the cars go by it. It's actually kind of nice. And it's interesting if you look at 10th Avenue today and you might be looking down there at times and saying, gosh, the traffic looks terrible. Um, promise you, whatever you see down there is nothing like what you would have seen before the High Line was built. So the whole reason they decided to elevate these train tracks over here is that the train lines, rather than running above 10th Avenue, used to run 
right down 10th Avenue. So when the trains carry a lot of these freight trains would come into New York City, they would come down 10th Avenue and they would actually go right down the avenue along with all of the pedestrians and carts and horses and carriages and cars and all kinds of things. It was a giant mess. I was also super dangerous. Um, 10th Avenue was called Death Avenue because of how many fatalities there were uh, with train accidents. So to try to mitigate the number of deaths, they used to hire guys that were called the West Side Cowboys. These guys were in most cases, legitimate cowboys that they would hire to come to New York City. And they would sit on horses and they would ride out in front of the trains coming down 10th Avenue, waving red flags, pretty much screaming at people to get out of the way. Definitely better than having nothing. Ultimately, the West Side Cowboys weren't cutting it. They decided they needed to actually elevate the train lines and get them away from pedestrians. But the West Side Cowboys rode for many years up and down 10th Avenue. Not a thing you will see if you are sitting there at the Overlook today, though it'd be kind of fun if you did. But something that you would have seen for a long time. So speaking of new construction, uh, I said you'd be able to probably tell what was here before the tracks were elevated, what was built alongside the High Line, like the Whitney or the Standard Hotel and what's brand new. Here's some brand new construction. A lot of it's residential. This area has become super desirable and super desirable in New York City typically translates to super expensive. So right over here, you used to be able to see this so clearly from the High Line. This is all new development here, but that blue building straight ahead is the Chelsea Piers. That's a big sports complex. There's a driving range, batting cages, ice skating. Um, very, very popular. Um, but the Chelsea Piers also used to be the home of the former uh, of some former transatlantic piers as well. So in that stretch along the Hudson, you would have had, uh, first of all, the intended destination pier of the Titanic. You also would have had a pier a little further down, so Pier 59 and then Pier 54. When the Titanic survivors were picked up by the HMS Carpathia, they took the lifeboats from the Titanic, dropped them off at the Titanic's pier, and then took the survivors down to their pier. And there were thousands of people waiting there, hoping to see that their loved ones had made it and they were some of the people that had survived. Mm -hmm. And they go out to Prospect Park. So they do try as much as possible to keep a lot of the growth looking natural, like the wild growth that was happening here. Uh, you probably already saw some people out working. There are always people out here working. Much like Central Park, maintaining that wild natural look uh, actually takes a lot of work. <laughs> um, but it looks nice and I do think it's a, a great design. And this has, as you can tell by the new construction, completely changed this area. So right over here, you can see these red brick buildings that are very obviously older. And um, this is home of what we call the General Theological Seminary. Uh, the General Theological Seminary has an interesting history. So all of this area up here, today this is a neighborhood known as Chelsea. Uh, but originally this would have been a private estate that was also called Chelsea. Uh, Chelsea was owned by the Moore family. Most famous member of the Moore family was Clement Clark Moore. I want to take a quick pause to show you this. This is an art installation. That's one of the great things about the High Line is they have a lot of different art installations and they're changed out regularly. So if you take walks from time to time, you're sure to see something new. Clement Clark Moore was the owner of this property up here. 
and he owned the property at the time that New York was starting to change a lot. They were very clearly going to start extending the city up into this part of Manhattan. And so people who own property up in this area could essentially wait for the development to come to them or they could spur the development of their property along in a way that they wanted. Uh, he ended up donating his property to the theological seminary. And those are the buildings that were over there. And that's what became of most of his estate. You've possibly heard of Clement Clark Moore, even if you haven't heard his name before. I assure you, you have heard of his work. He was the author of a poem called A Visit from St. Nicholas, much more commonly known as Twas the Night Before Christmas. So even though he is where the neighborhood Chelsea takes his name, he's the reason that the Theological Seminary is there, a lot of things in this area. What most people know him as is the Twas the Night Before Christmas guy. Yeah, well. So you have some beautiful flowers at this time of year. If you manage to time it, spring is one of the really, really pretty times of year at the High Line. It's interesting to come here in each season though, I think. This area is called the Chelsea Thicket and you can see it is starting to grow in uh, pretty densely. But if you come in the winter when the trees are bare, everything looks very, very different. You can see the leaves change in the fall, flowers in the spring, really full leaves. So this I think confuses people. This is Church of the Guardian Angel. This is definitely one that people assume maybe was here before the train tracks were elevated and they just set it up in kind of an unfortunate location. You can see that the wall of this church is, I don't know, maybe one meter from the tracks. That is actually on purpose. <laughs> Their church was located originally a little further up, a few blocks up, and rather than being right next to the planned elevated tracks, they were going to be right in the way of the elevated tracks. And so they were told pretty much move it. <laughs> you got to move. Uh, the tracks are going to go there. And rather than fight the incoming change and the rail tracks, they decided to embrace it. They put their church right next to it. So every Sunday at Church of the Guardian Angel, when the trains were running, that was just a part of the service is every now and then you would hear the trains going by. <laughs> So here are some of the buildings here that would have predated the tracks being elevated. Obviously there were numerous other buildings that would have been demolished altogether, but there are some that are the older style low rise building that would be right up on the High Line. So if you're enjoying the tour so far, go ahead and hit the like button. It helps others discover the video. If you'd like to see more like this one, subscribe to our channel. We have walks across the Brooklyn Bridge, through Harlem, Central Park, all over New York. Visit our website for more about our tours, our travel tips, and more. We also have virtual tours and channels that focus on Washington, D.C., New Orleans, London, and more. Look for free tours by foot wherever you travel. You can support your guide with virtual tips. Links in the description. And let us know what else you want to see. Leave a comment below. Now, back to the tour. So you can get a little look down this street here. Like I said, actually, at this point, very, very difficult to get any views all the way out to the Hudson from the High Line. It used to be very, very easy to do. Um, now, most of it has construction around. And there are these bleachers over here. It's closed off for some of the maintenance work right now, but that's another beautiful spot to sit is on those wooden bleachers. We've got some art here. Sorry, it's through the scaffolding, but there are some really nice large scale murals along the High Line. So if you're walking, you gotta make sure you look up every now and then. Another new apartment building. So this section of the High Line was not a part of the very first section opened. Section one was actually pretty short, uh, but this is section two. 
And for a long time, it was just sections one and two. The last section of the High Line is a pretty recent addition. It's where we'll be finishing up, is up towards the Hudson Yards near the new area. But over here, one of my favorite things you can see from the High Line, the London Terrace Apartments, absolutely massive. I think there's something like 1,700 apartments in the London Terrace. And it's my favorite thing there, not necessarily because I think the buildings are spectacular, though I think they're nice looking. Uh, I love the story behind the Hudson Terrace apartments. These were being developed in the 1920s, late 1920s and into the early 30s. And this was being done by a man named Henry Mendel, really massive development plan. And the whole idea was you were starting to see the expansion of people living up in this part of the island where they really hadn't necessarily before and he was hoping that there was going to be this, this growing class of people that worked in Manhattan and rather than living outside of the city, wanted to live right in the city. So he started envisioning the London Terrace apartments. It's gonna be massive. There was an Olympic sized swimming pool, a gym, all these amenities. So in all of this area, there had been a lot of row houses and single family homes. Most of them, the owners were paid to leave and they did. There was one holdout, her name was Tilly Hart. She was an older woman. She didn't even own the house. She was a renter, but she was convinced that she still had time on her lease and she was not leaving until her lease was up. It actually turned out later, her lease was already up. She just was confused on the months, but rather than packing out when Henry Mandel asked her to, or when the police asked her to, she said no. <laughs> and she continued to stay in her home she barricaded herself inside. People approached. She would throw bricks out her window. Uh, finally, the police came and they took all of her belongings out and they put them on the sidewalk. She went back inside and slept on the floor. Eventually, she did relent. Her house was torn down. And that was where the cornerstone was laid on the London Terrace Apartments. But it is absolutely one of my favorite stories in this area. Uh, another cool installation here. You can see the water dripping down. This is called the Fountain of Tears. So the nice thing is because all of the work changes so often at the High Line, they will usually put up some information about the artist, about the work, so that we can all keep it straight. So straight up ahead, it's relatively plain looking building, the kind of beigey one, doesn't have any ornamentation whatsoever. Artists. Surprisingly, same architect, Cass Gilbert, as the Woolworth building, and also the very beautiful, very ornate uh, uh, customs house or former customs house down near Battery Park. So anybody that's ever seen Cass Gilbert's other work is, would be absolutely astonished to find out this is same guy because most of his work if you've ever seen the Woolworth or the customs house very very ornate very lavish but there's a quote from him I'm not going to remember it verbatim but he said he thought there was something really beautiful about just like a great gray mass of building and by leaving it relatively plain that the lights and shadows would play differently with it at different times of day so kind of unusual, but I always, I always just like to point it out to people just because it's so, so, so different than any of his other work. And a lot of people are familiar with at least one of his other buildings. Okay, we're actually coming up on the end of what we would call section two of the High Line. One of those first two sections, you can start to see these big glass buildings up ahead, and that is a part of the Hudson Yards. So that's where we'll be finishing up. So this Cass Gilbert building today has a few different things in it, but I think there's actually still to this day uh, there's a day school and a very expensive private school in that building.
So this area, you can actually see maybe from here, a few signs for galleries down this street. That is one of the things Chelsea, the neighborhood is very, very famous for is being really the, the center hub of the art gallery scene in New York. I think there are over a hundred galleries in this neighborhood. Um, and some very famous places um, that at some point you could see from the High Line and are not as visible anymore. One's called The Kitchen, a uh, famous place originally for videographers, uh, video artists to display their work. Got its name because it actually started in the kitchen of the Mercer Arts Center. And the kitchen is now a much, much larger place uh, there in this neighborhood. The Dia Foundation, another um, famous arts foundation in this area, and lots of small galleries up and down. And there is also here this kind of photo frame. Um, you can take a photo of yourself looking out over part of Chelsea. So even though most of what you'll see is a lot of the newer construction, there are some of the older buildings in the area. So bear in mind that most of the older stuff if it's not the church or some of those smaller low-rise apartment buildings, a lot of this area was at one point industrial. In addition to the food production companies in this area, you had a lot of factories and warehouses as well. You get a little glimpse, if you can see there, of the Chrysler building. There used to be a really interesting view of the Empire State Building from the High Line where it lined up with one of the towers of the Theological Seminary. And unfortunately, because of where some things are placed now. You can't see that anymore, but you should always keep an eye out to the right when you're walking on the High Line, because you will see some of the famous Midtown skyscrapers. You're further uptown at this point than people think. Yeah, so There's the Empire State Building now. You can see it through the trees. And show you some of the... So you start to see a little shift in the plants here. Each section of the High Line is slightly different, even though it's all done really in the same style with things growing up and looking wild and natural. They do have different plants in different sections of the High Line. So there is variety throughout. You're not just going to see the same thing all up and down. So some original apartment buildings right next to some brand new ones. Um, and then a very obviously new offering over here. Though I do like some of their sculptures. Um, so these are sculptures, I believe, that the High Line put in. They don't have anything to do with this building. It's a Alma Allen sculptures. That giant building over there. Yeah. You'll actually see okay, it continue so for a while because I think it's I almost an entire city like block. Uh, oh, there's another good view of the Empire State Building. But the big boxy looking building is a U.S. Postal Service building. Uh, it's a mail distribution center. Generally not the most interesting looking building in the world, but they do have an impressive green roof. Um, and they were talked about a lot back uh, during the big anthrax mail scare in New York City. That building was sort of at the center of that. So we'll be heading up into Hudson Yard. So up here, originally, this is where the rail lines would start to veer out towards the Hudson River. It was called the Hudson Yards because it was a train yard. <laughs> you could see all of these trains lined up. Oh, here's another really pretty installation piece. I really like that. That one is called One Second. So the Hudson Yards is a new development built out over what was once the rail yards. And this is the largest private development project in New York City since Rockefeller Center. So it's been a while since there was a project built on this scale. 
is definitely a signal of the change in this area and what what the High Line has done in this area. I think back 20 years ago, it would have been inconceivable that somebody would have wanted to do this kind of development in this area. This part of Manhattan was very, very different at the time. So the Hudson Yards, these are a lot of different things. Uh, there's apartment buildings, there's office buildings, there's some, in, there's some restaurants, there's some markets, um, a cool large scale sh sculpture piece called The Vessel. And we'll see all of that in just a minute. But this was all just opened up a few years ago. So this is definitely the most recent addition. I'm actually going to show you this map here just so you can get an idea like on a map of Manhattan where we started down there at Gansevoort. And we've gone up 10th Avenue. And so you can see where it starts to veer left and then hook. That is where we are heading now. So there's a Spanish food hall down here. I have been, there are some really delicious things there. Highly recommend checking it out. There's, an, there's actually a very cool little spur. If you walk out this way, most people just veer right straight ahead, um, but there is a nice little spur. If you go that way, if you want just a different view and there's some sculptures along there. So you get to do a little bit of a choose your own adventure thing. That coppery colored thing that you can see is the vessel, but we're gonna loop along the High Line proper and go finish the rest of the track. We're going to continue right along the High Line for today, but we have a whole separate video that's walking around the Hudson Yard, so make sure you check that one out too. You can see the rail tracks do continue up here. It doesn't look nearly as overgrown or native meadow up here, but you do still have some planting up in this area. You can never film a video walking in New York City without somebody trying to be in your video. So I'm glad we checked that box today. All right, you can see there's still some construction in this area. This is a really, really big development. I think it's probably reasonable to expect that there's going to be ongoing construction here for a while yet. But I, one of the things I do like about this section of the High Line that's very, very different than the other sections of the High Line is you get to walk on the actual rail tracks. This is where the majority of the planting is in the rest of the High Line. And so you don't get to do this. You don't get to see them as closely. And now this is the only part of the High Line where you get a lot of views of the Hudson River. That really did used to be most of it. Um, but like I said, so much development. You don't get to see too, too much of the Hudson from the High Line until you are all the way up here at the end of it. And start seeing it opening up here. And Hudson Yards does still mean rail yards. You can see all those trains lined up down there. So even though there is all of this new development, it still holds some of its original purpose. There are still rail yards there. That giant structure behind the rail yards is the Javits Center, the Javits Convention Center. This is called the Pershing Square Beams. Um, it's closed off right now, but typically you can actually come. It's actually really meant for small children if you can see how little those openings are but you can come so another way of incorporating a lot of the original structure here and just repurposing it using it in a different way yeah. 
So even though technically this does continue all along the spur there, they do have this closed off right now. Over here you can get a little history. And there, right in the middle, is a picture of one of those West Side Cowboys. So if you thought I was making that up, I definitely was not. But here is a look at the Hudson Yards. And then nestled down there in between the buildings, that thing that looks like kind of like a beehive, copper beehive, that is the vessel. So all of this just recent growth in this area. So in walking the High Line and seeing these old elevated tracks that they built just to get them off of the street in the 1930s, it's amazing what a long life this structure has had and how many changes it's gone through over the years and how it has also changed all of this part of New York City. All right, so we're here as far as they'll let us walk on the High Line today. Thanks so much for joining me. We hope we will see you next time. If you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to our channel. Ring that bell so you get notifications every time we release new content. And take some walks with us other places. Check out some of our other cities like London and New Orleans. You can take walks all over the world from right wherever you're sitting at the moment. All right, we'll see you next time.